Welcome to the History of European Theatre podcast. Although the narrative of theatre history is on a between-season hiatus, I couldn't let the anniversary of Shakespeare's birthday pass this year without putting an episode together. So, here is a bonus episode with just a few glimpses of the life and times of William Shakespeare. It's called Windows on a Shakespearean Life. Part 1. Birth Beyond the normal chances of birth, being born in a place and a time that allows for life, good health, education, expression, success, the avoidance of incapacitating illness, serious accident or plain bad luck that cuts a life short, it's lucky that William Shakespeare survived to adulthood. He was born in April 1564. We don't actually know which date in the month. The first and one of the few official records of his life is for his baptism on the 26th of April at the Holy Trinity Church, Stratford-upon-Avon. But there's a long-standing tradition that he died on his birthday, so the 23rd it is. His parents, John and Mary, had already buried two infant children, girls who died of unknown causes, the youngest only a year previously. William, being a boy, must have been a good omen for them. John could believe his family name would be carried on, although he couldn't have had the slightest idea about how well-known that family name was to become. Boys were good news in those days, and William was no doubt kept carefully warm and protected from the chill of a church in April, even as the vicar, one John Bretchgirdle, poured the baptismal waters onto him, taking the infant into the body of the still new Protestant church. The parish records show that at that time the local population of the town and its outlying farms, villages and hamlets was less than 2,000 souls, so a minor town in a rural setting. In the first half of 1564, the same records show only 20 deaths, but by the end of the year that number had increased tenfold, with about one in seven of the local population dying. The start of the problem is noted in the margin of the record book next to the burial entry for one Oliver Gunn, apprentice, on the 11th of July. Hic incepit pestis. Here begins the plague. This latest visitation of plague had been rife in London since about six months ago. The story of the terror of the plague in the city must have reached even distant towns like Stratford. Historian John Stowe witnessed the effects in the city and recorded the suffering of the populace and the selfishness of the rich in his work The Annals of England. The first of three substantial volumes was published in 1592, with subsequent volumes following in 1601 and 1605. The last volume included entries up to the end of March that year, just ten days before the author's death. Of the plague in London he wrote... What an unmatched torment it was for a man to be barred up every night in a vast silent charnel house, hung to make it more hideous with lamps dimly and slowly burning in hollow and lingering corners, where all the pavement should, instead of green rushes, be strewed with blasted rosemary, withered hyacinths, fatal cypresses and yew thickly mingled with heaps of dead men's bones the bare ribs of a father that begat him lying there, here the chapless hollow-set skull of a mother that bore him. For so much as the plague of pestilence was so hot in the city of London, there was no term kept at Michaelmas. To be short, the poor citizens of London were this year plagued with the threefold plague, pestilence, scarcity of money, and the dearth of victuals. The misery whereof were too long here to write. No doubt the poor remembered it, the rich by flight into the countries made shift for themselves. Along with the whole country, Stratford suffered, but the young Shakespeare survived. Not for the only time in his life his luck held. None of the well-wishers visiting his nursing mother carried the plague into the house. No infected fleas bit him, no chill crept into his chest, no household accident, badly attended fire or any other childhood danger took him away before he had a chance to flourish. Part 2. The Schoolroom The school day started early, six o'clock in the summer, seven in the winter in a concession to the delayed dawn. 
We've no proof that Shakespeare attended the local school, but thanks to his father being on the town council, he would have been gifted free schooling, and it's inconceivable that his ambitious father didn't make sure that his son took full advantage of this. For six days a week, Sunday being excluded of course and Thursday and Saturday being half days, the local boys were drilled in Latin. The school was the grammar school, a term that survived into the late 20th century in England as a designation for a particular type of school, but at the time it meant Latin grammar. Rote learning was the order of the day. Verb forms, numbers, cases, genders, articles, translation from Latin to English, translation from English to Latin and more. This wasn't fun and was not designed to engineer free thought, quite the opposite in fact. In the same style of the religious learning of the day, there were correct answers to be given, quickly and with confidence. Learn those and you got by. Think too much, pause, sound unsure, and you'll feel the lash of the schoolmaster's tongue, or worse still, the sting of the birch. The young Shakespeare wasn't quelled. He even parodies the whole experience in The Merry Wives of Windsor, in a section of verbal jests that demand some understanding of the school system and Latin to be fully appreciated. It's one of those obviously meant to be funny but we don't quite get it passages in Shakespeare that later generations struggle with, but would have had his contemporaries who had experienced similar treatment at school laughing out loud. The young King Edward, building on the groundwork of an educational system started by his father, had funded the establishment of local schools to create a countrywide opportunity for at least some of the young boys under his rule, with the express intention that... Good literature and discipline must be diffused and propagated throughout all parts of our kingdom, as wherein the best government and administration of affairs consists. Elizabeth also played her part in promoting and changing the educational system. Under her watch, the works studied in Latin were changed, with the removal of the Catechism and Augustinian works promoted under Henry VIII, with all their Catholic leanings. These were replaced with Ovid, Virgil, Terence and Plautus. They were pagan writers, but at least did not provide a counter-argument to the Calvinistic Protestantism that Elizabeth was promoting. These rediscovered greats from antiquity supported the beginnings of a grounding in Roman-style debate and argument that was the basis for the education that could take a young man with enough natural intelligence and sharp wits to university, and from there into the church or the burgeoning bureaucracy that was needed to run the expanding Elizabethan state. In his standard textbook of the day, Erasmus says that the study of Latin classics was of the highest value. He said, In this kind of thing it is best that youth be exercised variously and diligently, because, besides the fruit of style, by this means they imbibe the old and the memorable stories, as if doing something else, and fix them deep in their memory. They become accustomed to the names of men and places. Moreover, they learn especially the power of honesty and the nature of probity, the special virtues of eloquence. But hang on a moment. These old stories, the Romans retelling the Greek myths, weren't they often driven by flawed characters who gave way to greed, lust or hubris? Didn't they often turn on an act of treachery? Were these really the models for good Tudor citizens? Or where there was a spark granted by nature, nurture or both, Did they just feed the imagination of the young scholar? Part 3. The Players By all accounts, John Shakespeare was not an easy man, but he was certainly ambitious. His glove business was doing well, and he had a profitable side business trading in sheep's wool. He married the daughter of a local farmer and started a family. Then he started to move in local political circles and took on roles in local government. He became the town ale tester, checking the quality of not only the beer, but the bread too, confirming the accuracy of weights and measures at the local court. He was promoted to constable and then to the position of a fever, the official who collected fees at the local court. Other appointments followed. Burgess, then borough councillor, then, as his wife was expecting what was to be her first son, he became the town chamberlain, in charge of the civic accounts. In 1568, he was appointed bailiff of Stratford, that is, the town mayor. That meant that one of his many duties was approving public performances by roving troops of players. It's possible that he took his young son to see some of those performances. Most likely, what was on offer was morality plays, which were the most popular form of theatre of the time. 
The short plays retold stories from the Bible with the express intention of presenting Christian moral lessons on the importance of good conduct and virtuous character. It's also possible that Shakespeare witnessed the festivities associated with the Queen's royal progress in 1575, when Elizabeth visited the Earl of Leicester's Kenilworth estate, just 12 miles away from Stratford. The royal progress featured lavish pageantry and the production of a customary performance known as the Hock Tuesday Play. The origins of this play are obscure. It was traditionally performed on the second Tuesday after Easter, but had been suppressed early in the Reformation because of public disorder that had become associated with it. The presentation in 1575 was a revival that Elizabeth had permitted. The substance of the play is a commemoration of the defeat of the Danes in 1002 by the Anglo-Saxon king Ethelred, and consists of a mock battle between English and Danish knights and the defeated Danes being led off by English women. This in turn is probably an adaptation of an older custom where on Hock Tuesday, women could capture or hock a man with a rope. The unfortunate captive had to pay a forfeit to be released, the collected fee going to the local church. The idea that Shakespeare could have been aware of the Queen's progress gains some credibility when we see that much later he references an elaborate water feature that had been on display during the Queen's visit, this in Twelfth Night. Aside from these specific events, Shakespeare would also have certainly witnessed, or at least known about, the many folk festivals that continued to thrive into the 16th century, despite attack from Protestant reformers. It's also likely that Shakespeare ran into acting troops soon after leaving school. It's been much speculated that Shakespeare may have found employment as a private tutor, although there's no direct evidence that he applied for or was granted the necessary licence. His Latin would have put him in good stead for such a job, and it may be that in about 1580 he went to work in Lancashire as a family tutor for a local gentleman, Alexander Houghton. Houghton was a wealthy man and kept a troop of players in his pay. When he died in 1581, he left a number of musical instruments and theatrical costumes in his possession to his friend Sir Thomas Hesketh, along with a note requesting support for one of his retained men, one William Shakeshaft. If this is young William, budding actor, then Hesketh may have helped him to find a place in the house of his neighbour, Henry Stanley, Lord Strange, who also kept a professional troop of players, known quite sensibly as Lord Strange's Men. Some members of this troop went on to form the core of the Lord Chamberlain's Men, the troop with which Shakespeare was to have many successes. As for Shakespeare Senior, life got tougher as his son's fame rose. Still riding the wave in 1569, he applied for the granting of a coat of arms, but it wasn't granted at the time for unknown reasons. In the late 1570s, he was prosecuted for illegal dealing in wool and usury, the illegal lending of money. The sums involved in both sidelines were considerable, and the implication is that John made some bad judgments and overextended himself financially. He seems to have been caught in a downward spiral, and in the 1580s he failed to attend council meetings and eventually lost his position as alderman in 1586 due to non-attendance. In 1592, he's mentioned with several others as staying away from church from fear of being arrested for debt. In 1576, he withdrew from all aspects of town life and, never able to recover his fortune, lived quietly until his death in 1601. Part 4. Marriage Men, it seems, married relatively late in the rural regions of Elizabethan England. Studies of the parish records in Warwickshire from the time suggest that more than 70% of men married between 20 and 26 years of age. Given human nature, raging hormones in both young men and women, and the lack of available and effective contraception, one might have expected that age range to be a lot lower, and the record of teenage men held to shotgun weddings a lot more prevalent. In the same analysis, it's seen that women tended to marry at a younger age, usually some five to seven years younger than their groom. Yet some of the most commonly known facts about Shakespeare's personal life is that he married young, at 18 in fact, and that he married an older woman. His bride was eight years older than he, and she was pregnant on their wedding day. And what does that tell us about the young Shakespeare? Was he rebellious, 
Uncaring of the social stigma, public knowledge of fornication or the birth of a bastard child would bring to his family, to his father, the Glover, respected tradesman and respected, if not liked, in civic circles? Or was it just uncontrolled ardour, the moment of interruption missed, the act undertaken once too often? Perhaps the young man was manipulated by the older woman, fast becoming sat firmly on the shelf. Or perhaps it was he who manipulated this older, wealthier woman as a means to support his ambitions. Perhaps the mistake made, his honour wouldn't allow him anything but the rushed marriage. The records surrounding this question are sketchy and inconclusive. There was a rushed marriage, where a special licence was obtained that did away with the usual period necessary for reading the wedding bands publicly. But the prospective groom's name on the licence is spelt differently and the prospective bride is named as Anne Wheatley. One of the conditions for a special marriage licence was that a bond of surety had to be placed. Such a bond is lodged at the time under the name of Anne Hathaway. In a time before the printing press had finally formalised the spelling of English words, names are often shown in various forms, presumably as they were heard by the clerk writing them down. And no one seems greatly concerned by this, but it leads to an air of uncertainty. Both names were common in the area at the time, but Anne is otherwise referred to as Agnes, spelt A-N-N-E-S, and pronounced Agnes, with a hint of a non-existent G. Waitley appears nowhere else in reference to her, but the use of the name could just be a clerical error. In the same register, recorded on the same day, a William Waitley was up before the church court. Perhaps, in copying the document, the clerk simply got distracted for a moment and transposed some names from the documents piled next to each other from the day's business. And if William and Agnes needed any defence for nothing more than their ardour and exuberance, at the time, once a solemn promise had been given between the couple, the union was considered legal, and hence the importance of the public reading of wedding bans, so that any such promises could be rooted out. Marriages were often consummated before the wedding ceremony without censure. What we can say, with more certainty, is that Susanna Shakespeare was baptised on the 26th of May, 1583. The marriage of her parents took place in December 1582, and with nature working as it does, there can be no doubt that Agnes was pregnant when they married. Part 5. Poet January 1593. Plague again. By order of the Privy Council, for as much as by the certificate of the last week, it appears that the infection doth increase. We think it fit that all manner of concourse and public meetings of the people and plays, bear-baiting, bowlings and other like assemblies for sports be forbidden. As it transpired, theatres were closed in London for the next 18 months. Shakespeare was already an actor and aspiring playwright. The acting troops took to touring in the safer parts of the country, presenting their shows in open spaces and, when allowed, in communal buildings, funded by box office takings and, on occasion, by subsidy from the local councils, happy to see and promote London theatre in their own small part of the world. But for Shakespeare, it was a time of metamorphosis. The dating of Shakespeare's plays is not always straightforward, but it's likely that before the hiatus he had written The Taming of the Shrew. The history plays Henry VI, parts 1, 2 and 3, although maybe not in that order, Two Gentlemen of Verona and Titus Andronicus. Richard III might have been written just before the plague struck, but was probably not performed until the reopening of the theatres later in 1594. In those 18 months of enforced seclusion and, we can only imagine, a slowing of the hectic pace of the life of the young artist around town, Shakespeare stopped being the jobbing actor, the copier of old plays, the man who patched the plays in the repertoire to amend them to circumstances and no doubt improve them. In this time of plague, he became an original poet. April 1593 saw the publication of his poem Venus and Adonis, and it soon became a bestseller being reprinted 15 times before 1640. The content of this long poem pushed the boundaries of what was acceptable in print. His retelling of the unrequited love of Venus for Adonis hit the mark with the young literary set and the undergraduates who appreciated the stylistic challenges of the work that was essentially pastoral, but at times comic, at times tragic, and perhaps most significantly, at times erotic. 
likely based on a much shorter version of the story by Ovid, who, thanks to his schooling, Shakespeare could read in the original Latin, and printed in good quarto by Richard Field, another Stratfordian working his trade in London. The poem is dedicated to Henry Worthersley, 3rd Earl of Southampton. In the dedication, which is in effect a request for patronage from the Earl, the author recognises it as his first truly original work, calling it The Heir of My Invention. Shakespeare then set about following up this success, and a year later The Rape of Lucretia was published. Once again, Richard Field was the printer, and the quarto edition was sold by John Harrison from his shop in St Paul's Churchyard. In the dedication of the poem, the author refers to his duty to the Earl, so it seems that his previous request for patronage was well received. Although not as popular as Venus and Adonis, it was still a good seller, going through eight editions before 1641, and more significantly, the originality of these works and the association with Southampton proved that this playwright poet could not only appeal to the penny-paying audience in the rough and tumble of the theatre, but to scholars, lords, ladies and the court as well. The plays Shakespeare produced immediately after the plague-enforced hiatus were of a higher calibre than the pre-plague plays. Just think of the intellectual brilliance of Love's Labour's Lost, the unparalleled imagination of A Midsummer Night's Dream and the masterful story development from adolescence to maturity in Romeo and Juliet. Shakespeare had used his time well and come of age as a poet and a playwright and was on a course to produce his greatest works. Part 6. London Shakespeare was born in the provinces, but his trade brought him to London. In this way, he was similar to many of his artistic contemporaries. London's population was close to 200,000 souls at the end of the 16th century, making it one of the largest cities in Europe. The diverse population, made up of locals and incomers from the countryside and abroad, made it a lively, exciting and sophisticated place. But it was also squalid, infested with crime and corruption and, of course, subject to regular bouts of plague. Shakespeare is confirmed in London by 1592, with a performance of Henry VI Part I at the Rose Theatre, but the suggestion is that he'd already been there for several years before that, long enough to start making a name as a playwright and an actor. His first residence at the time was likely in Shoreditch. Then it was a very poor area, made up of poorly constructed shacks and tiny alleyways, where homes leaned towards each other over gutters of flowing human and animal sewage. But it was connected to the theatres, all built outside the city and on the wrong side of the Thames, alongside other entertainments and men and women ready to sell you their services in a myriad of ways. Shakespeare was among the budding literary set who lived there, young writers and actors, older poorer actors and would-be performers, striving to find a voice for their art and living amongst some of London's poorer citizens. But by 1596, Shakespeare had moved to Bishopsgate, Still in a poor area and still close to the Thames, but inside the city walls, so a definite step up from Shoreditch. Records of the taxes paid by residents suggest that Shakespeare was now a long-term resident. These same records show him defaulting on the payment of some local taxes, and that at some point late in 1598 he moved across the river to Southwark. That could be related to the non-payment of tax, but it also coincides with the building of the Globe Theatre nearby. The man of the theatre being close to his place of work makes perfect sense, but in 1603 he moved to lodgings in Silver Street and Cripplegate. To get from there to the theatres involved a walk across the city, past St Paul's and down to the river to catch a water taxi. It was a journey of up to an hour on foot. It seems that Shakespeare was distancing himself from the hub of theatre activity, for all the inconvenience that that entailed. By 1603 Shakespeare was at the height of his powers, Henry V, The Merchant of Venice, Much Ado About Nothing, As You Like It, Julius Caesar and Hamlet had all been produced in recent years, and Othello was about to be unleashed the following year. He was an actor, with a familiar face to many. The theatres of the day produced performances daily and were regularly filled with thousands in the audience, especially in the summer months. Standing in front of the stage cost just one penny, and Londoners thronged to the first purpose-built theatres. 
Those in the local area probably attended more frequently than those who had to make the boat trip across the river. So in the locality, the actors who appeared on stage daily, performing a different part regularly and changing plays often if the box office takings dropped, were well known. Shakespeare, as a playwright and poet, was also part of his public persona. He was referred to in poems and topical comedies of the time, had been critiqued by those who thought him above his station, and praised in print by those who saw his genius. His name is mentioned in anecdotes from the Inns of Court. He was a celebrity, and we can wonder if this move away from theatre land, this detachment from the world of public entertainment, was a deliberate move. Silver Street was a quiet, respectable area, perhaps what we would now call a bolt hole, where a well-known face could hide and find some peace and quiet. Part 7. The Death Scene Two months before he died, Shakespeare made a will. At this time, it was usual to only undertake such a thing when there was a fear of reasonably imminent death, but clearly he lived on. One story goes that he shared a meal and much drinking with playwright Ben Jonson and poet Michael Drayton, and that he died of a fever contracted there. This is recorded in the diaries of John Ward, the local vicar who, in 1662, was due to interview Shakespeare's only surviving child, Judith. Unfortunately, she died early that year, before any first-hand details could be gained from her. The story could be true. Johnson and Drayton both had local connections, so it could have been in Stratford. But they didn't much like each other, so maybe it's a conflation of two separate events. Possibly there was a final return to London for Shakespeare, and the fever was contracted on the long, chilly journey home. We'll never know. The only certainties we have come from the monument to Shakespeare in the Holy Trinity Church in Stratford that records that he died on the 23rd of April 1616 at the age of 53. The inscription in Latin compares Shakespeare to Socrates, Virgil and Nestor, the Homeric wise king of Pylos. Then there's a poem in English of dubious quality and somewhat obscure meaning. As a monument to one of the greatest men of literature, it's very low key, but we have to remember that at the time of his death being a playwright was not recognised as a worthy artistic profession, and however wealthy it had made him, there was a taint about anyone associated with the theatre. So, a decent burial and a memorial that befitted a local boy who'd done well for himself was probably nothing more or less than he expected. The real and fitting memorial to him came seven years after his death, when his friends, and most notably John Hemmage and Henry Condell, put his plays together in a collected works publication. This edition included 36 plays, 18 of which would have otherwise been lost to us, and it became known as the first folio edition. 235 copies are known to be in existence today, mostly held in public institutions, but a few are in private hands. In October 2020, a complete copy came up for sale and fetched £7.6 million. That's about $10 million. Ben Jonson, friend and rival, wrote the preface to that first folio edition and declared that Shakespeare was a writer not for an age, but for all time. But I'd like to leave the last word to Shakespeare himself. The Tempest, written in 1610, is his last play, or at least the last one that he wrote alone. The last it may well be, but it still innovates in its mixing of tragic and comic themes and for many ranks among the best of his works. One reading of the play is that it is a discussion on the creation and the nature of art, with Prospero the magician representing Shakespeare himself. So when at the end of the play Prospero is left alone on the stage to deliver an epilogue, it can be taken as Shakespeare's farewell to the theatre before his retirement in Stratford. In the final words of the play, Prospero requests that the audience set him free. He has abandoned his magic and pardoned those who've injured him. Now he requires that the audience release him from the island, which has been his prison, so that he might return to Naples. The audience's applause will be the signal that he is freed, and to that applause he leaves the stage. Now my charms are all o'erthrown, and what strength I have's mine own which is most faint. Now tis true I must be here confined by you, or sent to Naples. Let me not, since I have my dukedom got and pardoned the deceiver, dwell in this bare island by your spell, but release me from my bands with the help of your good hands. 
Gentle breath of yours my sails must fill, or else my project fails, which was to please. Now I want spirits to enforce, art to enchant, and my ending is despair, unless I be relieved by prayer, which pierces so that it assaults mercy itself, and frees all faults. As you from crimes would pardoned be, let your indulgence set me free.' 